Hello everybody and welcome back to Gripped. Today we're discussing Brexit. You may be tired of the issue, you may be not, but it does seem to be drawn to a conclusion under the reign of Boris Johnson. So joining us to discuss the matter today is Anthony Coughlin. He's the former senior lecturer in social policy at Trinity College Dublin and secretary to the National Platform for EU Research. So Anthony, you're very welcome and thanks very much for joining us. First of all, what is your own opinion on Leo Varadkar's approach in particular to Brexit negotiations? Well, I think the Irish government uh, has really got itself into a bind. I mean, the British or the United Kingdom, uh, the majority voted there to leave the EU. And that was a democratic decision they took. We may not have been happy with it, or the government, government wasn't happy with it. But once they take that decision, and once the British government uh, said they were going to implement it, we should have facilitated them, or sought to facilitate, facilitate them. Because, of course, it, influ it influences us very crucially, because the, the north-south border is the only, would be only the, the only land border between an EU state and, um, and the UK uh, when the British leave. But instead, the Irish government sided completely with, with Team EU, as they call it, to um, put every obstacle possible to Britain uh, against Britain leaving. And this is the so-called backstop, which they... The backstop means, in effect, that the EU and Ireland have a veto on Britain leaving the, leaving the EU, leaving the customs union and the single market, which is the heart of the EU, uh, unless and until the EU and Ireland are, are happy that there's no change in the border. So, in effect, it gives the EU, Brussels and uh, Ireland uh, a veto on Britain leaving. And that's why um, it was unacceptable to the British Parliament. Uh, Mrs May tried to get through the House of Commons um, three, three times, and they rejected it. And I think our people took, took the stand they did because they assumed that um, Brexit would be aborted or prevented in some, some way or another, either by a second referendum or by an, ele an election, or that if the British did leave, they really wouldn't leave the single market and customs union, which are the key EU institutions. So. Um, the Irish government went along with that as long as Theresa May was, was, was there. But of course, Theresa May is now gone, and there now is a government in Britain under Boris Johnson, which is determined to leave the EU on, at the end of October. And that is why the Irish government really does need to ch change its policy and, and to facilitate that and to walk out some sensible arrangement, because um, a sensible arrangement can certainly be come to, in my opinion. And what would that arrangement look like? Well, um, you see... The EU split the whole thing between two arrangements. One, a divorce settlement, which includes the backstop, and then the long-term trade agreement between the EU and the UK. But how can you know the character of the, of, of the Irish border, or what would happen to the Irish border, unless you know the long-term arrangement? So they put the cart before the horse. Now, what the new government in Britain wants to do is, of course, to, to raise the question of, of what long-term arrangement Britain and the United Kingdom has with the EU when they've left. Uh, most obviously, it should include a, f a free trade agreement. They've already got free trade in industrial goods and um, in, in significant areas of services as well. So uh, what, what happens over that is what's going to crucially affect the Irish border. And it's in our interest to have uh, th that free trade should continue between the United Kingdom and the EU. And all sensible people want that. And the British government uh, has said that they're not going to impose any significant structures you know, on the actual borders at customs posts, for example. Because nowadays, in any case, uh, customs posts are, are really largely irrelevant. When trade is fairly small, most trade is done by trusted traders, people who are trading all the time to, to and fro. And that can be monitored by um, you know, factory facilities and uh, monitoring in advance and so on and so forth. But these are the arrangements that should be discussed. In fact, when Enda Kenny was there, when Enda Kenny was teacher here, when the, when the United Kingdom referendum occurred in 2016, and seemingly he had told these customs people here and the, to, to, to discuss these matters with the British government. But when the Mr. Radker's government came in, uh, the whole attitude changed because they said, we are now going to stay with Brussels and do everything possible to prevent the British leaving, at least leaving the customs union in a single market. Uh, and that was the so-called backstop, which is... is wholly undemocratic, and in fact gives the EU and Ireland a veto on Britain leaving. And that's why it's objectionable and why it must fall and will fall. And so is it really the EU that's threatening to create a border between North and South here on this island? Well, that, that's, that depends really on the arrangements that have come to. If the United Kingdom leaves the EU, as I think they will, and leave the customs union single market, there have to be controls of some kind because the, the North-South border is then an external, the external frontier of the EU. There have to be... 
um, different, there'd be different laws in North and South, there were different health and safety regulations for animals and plants and milk going to and fro and cattle going to and fro and so on. So uh, there had to be some arrangements come to. But the British say we're not going to pose any control to the border itself. We won't have customs posts in the old-fashioned way. So the, the, the probability is that the EU is going to insist, uh, as long as we stay in the EU, that a border is imposed. And of course, uh, this makes a lot of people unhappy here. But so the pressure is, is to impose it, a border will come from the EU rather than from Britain. Is it the case that the EU simply want to send a message to any other countries that are threatening to leave or considering it, that this will be the consequence, will make life very difficult for you? I think that's part of the, part of the whole thinking from the beginning. Because and Mrs May's government didn't really want to leave the EU properly at all, despite the rhetoric. They wanted, you know, they said they'd accept the referendum result, but as long as there were some changes made in, in migration controls, they'd like to stay in the common market and single uh, uh, and customs union, the EU cost, customs union, as you know, which means that the EU does all trade agreements. So the British really wanted to stay in that under the May regime and her civil servants who negotiated the withdrawal agreement and Mrs May herself seemingly uh, went along with this, as long as they were allowed to control migration and the withdrawal deal allowed that. But that ac wasn't accepted to the British Parliament, it wasn't accepted to those who really wanted a proper Brexit uh, for the United Kingdom, where Britain and the North of Ireland would leave the EU properly, so that they'd get back the power to make all their own laws, no longer have to make major contributions of 10 billion a year to the EU funds, and control migration, etc. That's the real Brexit. And um, the Johnson government, uh, supported by the Conservative Party and some sections, some people in the Labour Party, want that. And they're now determined to get it. So uh, the whole situation has changed with Mrs May's departure because she really was only not really meaning to leave the EU properly. She was on half uh, stay in, she wanted to stay in the cost of doing the single market. And the backs have allowed her to, do, her to do that. And now the new government wants to change that and will change it, I believe. And so take, for instance, Switzerland. It has an open border with its EU neighbours. Is it possible that Britain will come to some kind of similar arrangement? Because that is the number one worry for Irish people, that a hard border would emerge where they'd have to show passports, where all goods would be checked, and yeah, where cars would be stopped as well. Yeah. Well, most people realise most countries in the world don't have any special agreement with the EU. The United States trades with the EU all the time. They have no, uh, they have no, trade, no special agreement, no trade agreement with the EU. Trade occurs under general World Trade Organization rules. Similarly, uh, Japan and uh, Switzerland and all these other countries. You don't have to be a member of the EU to trade with it. That, that. So it depends upon the, upon the deal. The, the, the free trade is, is, is widely accepted all around uh, for manufacturing goods anyway, all, virtually all over the world. Tariffs are very low. And the British government wants, wants a free trade deal. But um, the backstop has been used uh, to, to try and uh, keep the EU effectively in the single market, which means they have to accept all the EU laws governing, governing the manufacture and uh, character of goods and services and so on. And, and a vast array of um, EU legislation, which uh, comes all the, most of our laws now in the economic areas come from the EU. And uh, the British want to leave, leave that. And they say they're, they're not going to. They, they want free trade. They don't, they don't want customs posts on the border. So it comes down to what, what the trade agreement is. And, and that will be negotiated over the next two years. And um, uh, what, what uh, the, uh, Mrs May's government agreed to and what Mr Veranker and company wanted was um, an arrangement whereby the EU actually would have a veto on the Britain, Britain leaving the customs union and single market. And, and, and the backstop, this undemocratic backstop, gave them that veto in effect because they couldn't leave unless the, the EU and the Irish were totally satisfied that there'd be no, no, no controls of any kind between North and South. And that means that the Britain stays in the customs union and single market. So Britain now is, I think it's fair to say, headed by a real Brexiteer, someone yes. who's intent on taking the British out by hook or by crook without a deal, if that's what it takes. Do you see this end in, in economic disaster for this country? No, I don't. I think that it's in the interests of, of both the United Kingdom, Britain, uh, and the EU, and us, to have, have a free trade agreement. It's in the interests uh, of all the key parties. But what the, up to now, the EU, supported by Mr. Radcliffe's government, has been trying to, in effect, prevent the British really leaving, or prevent it leaving the customs union, in part because they're afraid that if the British leave, other countries will follow. I mean, the British is a major economy. It's the, I think it's the fourth largest economy in the world. It's a major blow to the EU that a democratic vote by, by the majority of the United Kingdom should say we want to leave this institution. Remember, we had two votes 
uh, when we, the Irish voters voted to uh, not to ratify the Treaty of Nice in 2001 and the Treaty of Lisbon in, in 2008, and we were forced to rerun the referendums uh, without any change we made in the treaties. So uh, I think our establishment and the Brussels people thought that while Mrs. May was there, a similar thing was going to happen, that uh, the British could be induced to stay in the cost of in the single market, and, and the backstop was ideal from that point of view. But now you've got a government that is intent on leaving. Now, the, the, the Johnson government has got a very small majority, only one or two. And the question, will it be able to get a majority in the House of Commons? Uh, well, there's a kind of game of bluff going on. In, during the month of September, it will be clear whether the EU is going to modify its position or still insist that the Britain must either sign or ratify, approve Mrs. May's withdrawal agreement, or else leave without any deal. And nobody want, no sensible person wants that. So there's a kind of game of bluff going on, and we'll see sometime in September whether, in fact, uh, the, the, the EU and, and Mr. Fradka's government will modify the, their position. And if they do, then the way will be open to a sensible discussion between adults all around to get a, a sensible agreement, uh, which would leave the British leave, at the same time minimise any uh, requirement for uh, any kind of controls and different laws and so on, north and south. But it's possible that, um, that, that the, the EU may prove intransigent. Mr. Varadkar may, may say, we'll, we'll stick with Team EU. We won't put the, what's really Irish and British interests first. And we'll, we will you know, not countenance any change, in which case you could have a, a British crash out or leave without a deal. Or you might have a vote in the House of Commons, which might precipitate a British election. That's another possibility. And uh, which might happen. But it does look as if there's not time enough for that before the end of October. So the, the probability is that Britain will leave at the end of October, either with a deal, which is a sensible position, if the Brussels and uh, Mr. Varadkar modifies their position, or without a deal. And how would you characterise the government's performance thus far? I know they've came in for some criticism recently. Well, I think uh, as the prospect of no deal becomes clear, uh, and the drawbacks of not leaving with, with, with an agreement becomes clearer and clearer to Irish public opinion because of a major loss of jobs. And may, most of our trade with the continent of Europe goes through the, the Britain itself over, over the land bridge, you know, from, from Dublin to Liverpool to Calais and Dover and so on. And, and the, you want controls all along the way? Of course they don't. The British don't want the controls, but if the, the, the team EU and Brussels, supported by Mr. Varadkar, do insist on controls, well then, uh, public opinion here is going to get very, very uh, upset. I think that's already beginning to happen. We need to move away from this backstop. Uh, it's undemocratic, it's ridiculous, it was an attempt really to keep the British in the EU, and, um, and, uh, uh, and it's not in our interest. And people like Ray Bassett, for example, a former ambassador to Canada, and a number of other you know, sensible commentators have been making that point. Dan O'Brien, the well-known commentator in the, in the Independent, uh, uh, have been making the point that it's very foolish for the Van Anker government to stick to this line. It may have had some kind of logic when they thought that the, that Brexit could be aborted, or you have a second referendum, or Britain wouldn't really leave. But there's no logic now. You've got a government in Britain that's going to leave one way or the other. And even if you had an election and Labour got in, I think the long-run position would be that Britain's going to leave because the Conservative Party is committed now to that, overwhelmingly. So Varadkar, Coveney, etc., they're just essentially pawns and puppets for the EU overlords, are they? Is that fair well, to say? Well, effectively, they have been... Uh, they're, 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 working on Brussels' behalf, yes, because they assumed that, that Brexit could be stopped and aborted, with the support of the Irish Times, may I say, and uh, some other leading local commentators uh, who are very upset that uh, a country will want to leave the EU. We have a highly, what do we call, Euro-Federalist commentariat, a highly Euro-Federalist um, political class, people, career Federalists, as a friend of mine puts it, people who identify totally with the attempt to turn the EU into a kind of a super state, with themselves helping to run the show at the level of the Council of Ministers and so on and so forth, but with the laws we made in most economic areas we made in Brussels. That's now the position. We've given up our money, we've given up, we have to make contributions from now on. We're net contributors to the EU in terms of the budget. For the 40 year we joined in 73, that's 50 years ago nearly. For most of that time, we were getting more money from the EU than we were contributing. But in the last three or four years, we're contributing more. In the current year, we'll be contributing, I mean, net contributor for about, to the extent of about one billion. And if the British leave, as they will leave, our contributions will be expected to increase. And Mr. Varadkar said he'd be quite willing to pay extra contributions 
um, you know, to show how, how, how good Europeans we were. And of course, we gave away our fisheries when we joined, and then many people, these have been estimated to be extraordinarily valuable. But if we, you know, had a range with the EU which didn't tie us in the way we, we, we're tied in at the moment, we can have control of our own fisheries. And these issues will come up when the British really leave. So um, our people were in consternation at, at the, at least our, our establishment were in consternation at the uh, 2016 UK referendum. They said, oh, they, they must do the same in, in Britain as they did in Ireland and rerun the referendum. And a powerful media political establishment was seeking to do that. And this has made government, broadly speaking, cooperating with them, making some slight changes in the rules that would give them control of migration, or otherwise basically staying in the EU and the cost of union and the single market. And there was more growing opposition to that in the Tory party, and to some extent in some Labour circles. And that has now come to the fore. So you've got a government that's really committed to a real Brexit, and we should accommodate ourselves to it uh, and say, well, if that's what the British people want, it's in our interest to act as a kind of mediator between, the, between London and Brussels, try and get in a deal that's, that's as acceptable all round as can be, and that advances our interests and minimizes any controls uh, on the border. There have to be some controls because you have different laws, north and south, you have different health and animal food arrangements. So the question is to have these in the least obtrusive way. You don't want people having to show passports when they go from uh, Derry to Letterkenny and that kind of thing. And, and that's really not on. The British government say they don't want it. And the only people who might want it will be Brussels. So where do you see the EU headed in the next few years? Do you think they're going to push ahead with this idea of a fully federal, federalised Europe? Or will it be the case that Brexit will put the brakes on their plans? I think Brexit does certainly cause a big problem to those, the Euro federalists. But you must appreciate that the, the EU is already divided between those who use the Euro currency and those who don't. There are 28 member states in the EU, including Britain. But only 19 use the euro, including we use it and, and we joined it, uh, expecting the British to join, but, but then the British didn't. And um, so I think the, the, the euro, the attempt to turn the EU into a kind of super state, a uh, kind of federation, which effectively to some extent already is, will be largely on the area of the euro zone. And uh, they'll try and push ahead with that, but I think that the euro has huge problems as a, as a currency. and. Uh, you know, it's, uh, several European EU, Eurozone countries like Italy most obviously need, needs their own currency back. And you might argue we need our currency back because of course we're stuck with the euro which is overvalued now. As the pound sterling goes down and will continue going down if, when the British leave the EU, we're stuck with the euro at an overvalued currency which is hitting our exporters badly and encouraging competing imports which hits, hits uh, local business. So we very much need our own currency, and I think it's folly in the, in, in, in the first place to uh, abolish it, especially when we do most of our trade with currencies, with countries that, uh, that are outside the Eurozone. We've tied our, ourselves to the Eurozone, with which we do only one third of our trade. Our exports and imports are only one third with the Eurozone, the, the other 19 member states of the EU that use the Euro. But there's nine member states of the EU that don't use the Euro. Mm -hmm. They don't have it in Britain, for example. They don't have it in Sweden. They don't have it in Czech Republic and Poland. So we should really align ourselves with them, in my opinion. The states in the EU who have kept their own currency and try and come to some new arrangement because the EU is in deep crisis and Britain deviate. The Eurozone is in deep crisis. And that crisis is bubbling up over Italy already. And there could well be another major crisis for the Euro currency. But that's a different thing from Brexit. But Brexit, of course, adds to these problems. And I think the EU, the project of turning the EU into these different countries with their own different nationalities into a kind of super state where most of the laws are made by non-elected committees in Brussels, the Commission, the Council of Ministers and so on, that project is historically doomed in my opinion. Was... So who do you think might leave next if a country is to leave? I think Italy may well leave the Eurozone. It desperately needs its own currency back. But, not the, but not the EU? Well, there's no provision for leaving the Eurozone without leaving the EU. There's no legal way of leaving the Eurozone without leaving the EU. And I think that the, the, the Britain leaving is going to drastically weaken the EU as it is, encourage other leavers or potential leavers significantly. Well, obviously Italy, because the new Italian government is talking about getting back the lira. It, 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 it desperately needs the lira because it, it's got an overvalued currency. It, it, that means that it can't export and it's encouraging German competing imports uh, all the time and there's massive unemployment. And so going back to the lira would necessarily mean leaving the EU? 
As it stands, yes, because there's legally no way of how you can leave the, uh, the currency union without leaving the EU uh, itself. It's an obligation of EU membership. Every EU member must adopt the euro, the sole exceptions being Britain and, uh, and Denmark under the original treaties. Not all of them have done that. As I said, there's nine who haven't. But it's a legal obligation of EU membership that you give up your own currency and adopt the currency of this um, federal union. As Romano Prodi was once EU commission said, the two pillars of the nation state are the sword and the currency, and we have changed that. So when the Eurozone got its own currency, it got one of the major attributes of a state, the sword, an army, and a currency. It hasn't yet got a full army that was heading in that direction. It's got its own currency. Not all the EU, but 19 states in it. Of course, the most important are France and Germany. And Germany does very well out of the euro. Because uh, if, you, if countries in the eurozone went back to their own cur currencies and uh, got rid of the euro and went back to the Deutsche Mark or the lira or the Irish pound, the German mark would go to the roof and, and the Italian lira would go, would go down. In other words, German exporters would be hit, uh, whereas Italian exporters would, be, would benefit. So it, it, you need a, you, every country needs a currency which can you know, balance its payments at maximum output and employment at home. And that's prevented by the Euro mem Eurozone membership. But that's a different issue, of course, from Brexit. So maybe it's very much the case that Italy will play a wait and see game and first assess how Britain has done once out of the EU and then decide whether it could survive outside the Eurozone. Oh, well, that could well be the case. Which is perhaps why the EU want to punish Britain as much as possible. Yeah, certainly, yes, that is true. That is true. The, the real danger for the Eurozone is that Italy would leave. Greece needed to leave, but Greece is a small beer compared with Italy. Italy is a big country. And uh, the current Italian government uh, has talked about the need for getting back uh, its own currency, or it's talking about a second currency side by side with the euro. That's being talked about in Italy at the moment. And there's a great fear in, in Eurozone circles, the European Central Bank and so on, that the Italians might move to leave the, leave the Eurozone and get back, get back the lira to benefit their economy hugely. And that's the only way they can get their unemployment down. That, I think, will happen, or very probably will happen down the road. I don't see these 19 Eurozone states staying together with the one currency. One currency, one rate of interest for economies that are very different. I mean, Germany is one thing, and Austria and Holland on, on one side, they've got a, if they went back to their own currencies, to be, they'd be strong currencies, they've been kept artificially low by membership of the euro, which benefits their exporters. But countries like Italy and Ireland and, and Spain and, and, and Greece, are being kept in the euro, their currencies are implicitly artificially high, which is hitting our exports. As we now see, as sterling goes down, because we, we do most of our exports, the majority, two, nearly two thirds of our exports are to Britain, America, the rest of the world, outside the eurozone. We do only one third of our exports to the eurozone, and yet we've, tied our, we've adopted the currency of the eurozone. But that's a different issue, of course, from Brexit. Well, Anthony Cochran, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure.